Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, an update on an advanced missile program designed to take out enemy air defense radar. Find out where the program stands and where it's headed. Also, the first-hand story of a little-known insider attack that took place in the days leading up to the Iraq War invasion. Plus, how is the industrial base changing since the invasion of Ukraine? Our defense news team digs in for the answer. And information warfare in tomorrow's Navy. How is the service gearing up for this next generation fight? We have a report. It's those stories and more in the latest in news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon here on Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Colin Demarest. The Navy League held the annual Sea Air Space Expo in the nation's capital recently, and a lot of new and interesting tech was on display. One of the larger emerging systems was a set of upgraded missiles designed to take out enemy integrated air defense capabilities, also known as IAD. The Argum, or Advanced Anti-Radiation Guided Missile Extended Range, is getting an upgrade. Currently, Northrop Grumman is under contract to deliver production units of the Argum ER for fielding within the next two years. The system is being integrated into the Super Hornet, the Growler, as well as the F-35 aircraft. In November, the company successfully tested the unit on a moving target from an F-A-18. We spoke with officials at the conference to find out what's next for the system. The Argum ER was a specific upgrade to the Argum weapon to deal with the uh, longer, um, uh, the, the larger weapon engagement zones of our advanced enemy air defense systems. So uh, as our adversaries advanced and became uh, better at uh, defending their areas uh, of which we uh, might need to engage, uh, we needed a weapon that had additional standoff capability, higher speeds, and greater survivability. We're in the middle of a uh, developmental test, have uh, two more developmental test uh, events that we should be wrapping up in the next couple months, and then transitioning to a short uh, integrated test effort, and then following that up with uh, just a couple operational test events. Uh, concurrent with that activity, we'll be uh, performing the required shipboard certification testing, and uh, immediately after that, we should be able to declare initial operational capability. So developmental tests should be wrapping up in about three months, and then uh, inter integrated tests should take us a, a couple of more months after that. And then at the end of this calendar year, uh, or early part of fiscal, 20, uh, fiscal 24, we should be looking to uh, uh, complete our, our developmental test, operational test, and transition to initial operational capability. We have uh, two uh, initial production lots already on contract with uh, Northrop Grumman. Uh, in negotiations for our third one, uh, we'll be looking to award uh, our fourth uh, low rate initial production lot uh, following year and then uh, transition to full rate production in FY25 and uh, looking to extend our partnerships both with our um, uh, Italian co uh, partners uh, in development as well as uh, the Royal Australian Air Force and uh, get these weapons in the hands of our um, coalition warfighters as soon as we can. So we, what we're doing is we're taking the uh, advanced capabilities uh, that are coming along with the Argum baseline program, they've dovetailed those into the Argum ER program, and now we're just working on enhancements with the rocket motor design, and then tying those two together, we've gone through, again, uh, the four of six developmental test fl uh, flights, and really the next phase is more interoperability between the aircraft, and then overall functionality of the weapon performing uh, in a robust IADS environment. In other news from the Sea Air Space Conference, data, how to generate it, how to move it, how to protect it, and maybe most importantly, how to weaponize it. Communication security and information warfare were on the minds of many at the show, which featured speakers from the often overlapping cyber, networking, and intelligence worlds. Understood to be a fusion of offensive and defensive electronic capabilities, information warfare combines data collection, analysis, and manipulation to gain an upper hand before, during, and after battle. 
the explosion of advanced technologies and militaries the world over, as well as means to quickly distribute a message to huge chunks of people have given rise to the discipline and its persuasive powers. The topic was discussed heavily by Navy Rear Admiral Mike Studeman one day with remarks focusing on Chinese and Russian propaganda and ways to counter it. According to Studeman, the best tool to counter Chinese or Russian misbehavior may not be a missile or gun. Instead, it's a camera. The value of information was also discussed on another day by Lieutenant General Matthew Glavy, the Marine Corps Deputy Commandant for Information. Here are some of his comments. So I'm the uh, Deputy Commandant for Information. What the hell's that? Uh, the 37th Commandant General Neller put it together. And essentially, it's, it's about what we're going to talk about today. So it's taking uh, many of those uh, warfighting functions that didn't sit uh, as, as close to the Commandant from an organized, trained, and equipped standpoint as it needed to be. So what am I talking about? Intelligence, C4, cyber, influence operations uh, being, being the primary uh, uh, capabilities. We did likewise at our, MEF, uh, our Marine Expeditionary Forces at the MEF level, at our operational construct. By, by developing the MEF information groups. So again, converging uh, capabilities like the Communications Battalion, Intel, Intelligence Battalion, Signals Intelligence Battalion, our A A Air Naval Gunfire Liaison Companies, Anglico, our Comstrad Companies, all our PAO, our Defensive Cyberspace Operations, and ultimately PsyOps Company <laughs> together in a single unit with a singular commander, you know, executing unity of, of, of command. Uh, set, a, set on top of that uh, an information command center, and there the MEF commander can task an operational commander to get stuff done. And as we look at force design, we're in year four of force design. So, so what do I do day in the life? I listen very closely uh, to our commandant and determine, uh, to the best of my ability, how are we going to organize and train, equip the Marine Corps to execute the vision of, of force design. I'm going to start with a quote, uh, pretty recent, and see what the, if the audience can guess who this was and where it was. Right now, there are changes, the likes of which we haven't seen for 100 years. Of course, that's the last thing that President Xi said to President Putin on the steps of the Kremlin as they ended, ended their historic summit. They've blunted, they've built, they've globalized. Uh, this is real. It is real. So if we don't uh, start with an understanding of the adversary, we're going to be in an awkward place. And I will tell you, force design, the national defense strategy, is focused on this discussion, specifically that meeting, if, if you want to pick an epicenter. So change, change is really hard. Matter of fact, using my kids' vernacular, change sucks. <laughs> For more coverage on information warfare, grab your device and head to c4isrnet.com. And when we come back, the harrowing story of an insider attack on U.S. forces as they geared up to do battle with Iraqi troops in the final hours before the war began. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. On March 23, 2003 in Kuwait, members of the 101st Airborne Division were waiting at Camp Pennsylvania to cross the berm into Iraq. A U.S. Army sergeant who had self-radicalized launched an insider attack against leaders of the 1st Brigade. The rogue service member killed two fellow soldiers and wounded 14. None of them have ever received the Purple Heart. That's something Sergeant Major Bart Womack wants to change. Womack witnessed and, along with other soldiers, responded to the incident. He's also the author of Embedded Enemy, The Insider Threat. He joined us to tell his story. I was the first person to respond to this grenade attack. I was there from the initial boom until the capture and confession of Sergeant Akbar. On the eve of March 23rd, 2003, uh, 101st Airborne Division, 1st Brigade, was at their intermediate staging base at a place called Camp Pennsylvania in Kuwait. So it's a little after midnight now, it's March 23rd. A grenade, or a device, I should say at the time of what I know, rolls into the tent. I'm sitting at the end of the table um, where I could see down at, at the floor, and this thing roll into the tent, and there's sparks on the floor. Uh, I see these sparks 
say we're in the land of not quite right, and this is a not quite right grenade that's sparking before it explodes. I jump up, run to the back of the tent to get up the commander. So for all these nights that we had been uh, at this camp, he had gone to bed that particular night at 2200 hours. That was the earliest he had gone to bed. So he, he was asleep. Um, I knew he didn't know what was going on in that tent at the time. So I went to the back of the tent to wake him up, um, tell him to get his boots on. We got to get out of the tent. There's a grenade up there about to explode. Uh, by this time, uh, unbeknownst to me, it's an incendiary grenade that's starting a fire. Um, we had a generator light set right outside of the um, outside of the tent area, and the lights had been turned off. And it's dark in a tent, you can't see anything. And knew vaguely where the center of the aisle was by the time he got his boots on and said, we're gonna count to three and we're gonna run to get out of the tent. The back of the tent where he slept was all uh, boarded up, tied up, you couldn't get out of the back of the tent because of the air conditioning heating unit. I count to three, we run. Uh, I make it on the outside of the tent and he's not there. I turn around, whisper his name. And by this time, I know that we're under some type of attack. I whisper his name, and, and he's not around. I hear a gunshot. I pull out my 9 millimeter pistol. It has a magazine in it, but there's no ammunition. So a shot was fired prior to that that shot the executive officer that was in the tent as well. So when that grenade came in, he saw what I saw with those sparks on the floor. And um, I wasn't concerned about where he was going to go and his actions because he could see it. I was concerned about the commander because he was asleep. So I cocked my weapon and realized nothing happens. And um, I know that the XO was shot. Uh, and, and just knew his voice. And um, I, I'm defenseless. I can't defend him. So I go to the talk because I figure, well, I know they have weapons in there. Um, but hoping that their ammunition is in magazines and prepared to, to fire. So I go in there, and they, they, they hear what I hear with explosions happening. So by this time, a grenade has been thrown into the same tent that I came out of. I, actually, it was thrown into there while I was in there. I didn't know it at the time. By the time I get a weapon from the talk, as well as nods, um, and, of course, ammunition, I go back out and look for go to my tent to try to find a commander and executive officer, and they're not there. While I'm in there, another grenade has been thrown into the second tent, and another grenade has been thrown into the third tent, and someone else has been shot. I don't know all this at the time. I go to my tent, I look for an executive officer and, and the commander, and they're not there. At the same time, I'm trying to look for an enemy. Who, who, shot, uh, who shot Major Romain? Um, who threw the grenades into the tent? I go back in the talk, order someone to look for the commander and the executive officer while I search for the enemy. So that first time that I was out there, there was no one outside. It, it was dark, eerie, and, and just no one there. Um, I go back out and try to find the enemy. So now we know we're under attack. Um, we got two people shot. Um, I learned that grenades have been thrown in all the tents, uh, three of the tents, I should say. Um, and there's no sign, no sign of any enemy at all. By now, we're, we're searching the area, um, trying to find the enemy, begin a process of treating casualties. Our commander had been, um, a grenade had gone off in that first tent. It knocked him back into a sleep area. Uh, he had shrapnel in his arm and bleeding like a pig. So when he was finally found, he was brought to the talk, um, and he orders that we get accountability of our unit. So that call goes out on the radio. We get responses from all the units except one, and when they finally respond, we learn that one person is missing, Sergeant Hassan Akbar, and so are grenades and ammunition. So he becomes the suspect. That was a hard pill to swallow because we had to embrace the fact that this, this is one of our own.
and how do we find them on this camp with 4,000 people and they all are dressed the same? I leave the talk along with Major Kyle Warren that had been going to bunkers all night and checking on people, making sure they were doing the right things. And when we leave the talk, I go one way to tell leadership what we're looking for and who we're looking for. And he's doing the same thing, but he realizes that there's a bunker that he had not gone to. I would think any attacker, uh, especially in our military, um, we are trying to take out the head, the head person in charge, the headquarters, the head element, those are the decision makers. So from a perspective of it affecting the other members of the unit, well, that was big time. They, they knew that their commander had been injured. They knew several people within the brigade headquarters had been injured, uh, attempted murder of myself uh, and others, um, and, and it did affect them. The, the best thing that happened to us, again, we were, had just finished the orders process for the final time and were going to be crossing the border to go into Iraq, Iraq very, very soon, but it ended up being approximately 48 hours after the attack. That was the best thing that happened to us to have Camp Pennsylvania in our rearview mirror. No one ever talked about it the whole year we were in Iraq. No, no one ever mentioned that night. The people that were killed and wounded, those soldiers who survived, that their story needed to be told. And that's why I wrote the book, Embedded Enemy, The Insider Threat. If it can happen inside the close-knit brotherhood of the armed forces, then it can happen on any campus, community, or organization at any time and anywhere. What I've learned in all of this is that no level of education, ideology, or religion is above reproach. There is no profile. The insider threat is closer than you think. So although Akbar was not in communication with the terrorist organization and clearly has stated that he's the enemy of our country by wanting to destroy it, he also clearly carried out this attack under the premise of jihad ideology. But he wrote what he wrote, he carried out, carried out the attack, and we know that that attack is under the premise of not only jihad ideology, but American jihad and obviously uh, jihadi radicalized. What I want you to know is to join me in the fight, if you will, to get these service members that were killed and wounded in this attack, the Purple Heart Medal, under the premise of jihadi ideology. When we return, our personal finance expert gives you tips on protecting your debit card from fraud. Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack shows you how to protect your debit card from fraud. Fraud, unfortunately, is everywhere, but so are the weapons you can use to safeguard against bank account and ID theft. Along with staying vigilant about emails, calls, and texts, you have to stay on top of your accounts and the transactions you make daily. Knowing where your money is going keeps track of your spending while also keeping fraud at bay. Next is knowing how fraudsters steal your debit and credit card info. Be on the lookout for skimmers anywhere you swipe your card, ATMs, gas stations, and points of sale. Skimmers capture your card info when you swipe. Once crooks have it, they either sell it online or use it to make purchases. 
Card info can also be stolen when a merchant is hacked. Fraudsters steal the data as it passes through for authorization. While you can't prevent this from happening, you should be protected by your bank or credit union's zero liability policy for unauthorized purchases. So review your accounts daily, sign up for alerts through online or mobile banking, and be on the lookout for card reader overlays and hidden cameras. Staying on top of things keeps you a step ahead of fraudsters always. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next week. To get more coverage of military and defense topics, set your targeting computer to hit the exhaust port at Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps Times.com, as well as DefenseNews.com and C4ISRNet, you guessed it, .com. And to be the most up-to-date guardian in the mothership, sign up for our early bird brief for stories sent to your inbox. It's also an audio. Check out the podcast version out each weekday. And if social media is where you get your headlines, follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We'll be back after a quick break. And when we return, we learn how the defense industrial base is changing after the invasion of Ukraine. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. Lessons learned from Ukraine are shaping future policy for the industrial base on maintaining a reliable supply chain. What does that policy look like in practice and how exactly has it changed? In a recent webcast, we spoke with an expert on what's needed to mitigate vulnerabilities and surge domestic production without cutting off supply to U.S. allies. Here's part of that conversation. I wanted to dig in a little bit deeper on the sole source issue. Um, I, I believe a report came out earlier this year that did highlight some of those things. Javelin solid propellant rocket motor didn't have a second source. Um, there's one company, Williams International, that builds turbofan engines for most cruise missiles. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's also one main company, Paxi EMC, that produces the energetics for most missiles. One foundry that can produce the large titanium castings and so on. Mm -hmm. um, what are your biggest concerns in terms of sole source uh, issues right now? And, and what are you doing to mitigate it? Have there been any sole source um, <clears throat> instances that where you've been able to find a second source so far, uh, how is that going? Yes, I mean, this is this is also an issue that that um, the DoD faces quite frequently. Again, that goes back to the demand problem that we have, um, that we are not a very large customer, and many of the suppliers and things that we use in our systems are DoD unique. And so uh, we have many, many, many sole and single source suppliers for many of our components. And there's really almost um, no way to get around that. Uh, things that we are trying to do though to, to mitigate that is in some instances where there is enough demand trying to qualify a second source. Uh, so we do have the flexibility, we do have the capability to surge when the one supplier is having an issue because one supplier is having an issue with a component during our production surge, we can turn to that second supplier and have that. We're also really trying to leverage ally and partner capability in this area um, because they have suppliers that um, supply some of these critical components. They may not be qualified in our systems yet, but that's something that we can work on. Uh, we can also uh, turn to allied and partner sources to uh, aggregate demand if uh, they're using the same components we are, that provides enough demand to sustain the capability that's being used. So we can either have them use our suppliers in that instance, or we use their suppliers, but that aggregated demand really helps with that sustainment problem that we have in, in having more than one supplier. Um, we are definitely investing funding uh, in some of those key suppliers that we have found as pain points during the Ukraine uh, conflict, for instance, precision ball bearings that's been in the news um, previously, that became one of the key constraints, believe it or not, with many of these missile systems. They're used in, in exquisite guidance sections for these missiles, and um, they are highly precise ball bearings. So these are not ball bearings you can go to Home Depot and buy. Um, so we, uh, you know, we have one supplier, one main supplier that we use for that, but there are other suppliers out there. Um, and so we're working to bring those folks on board so that we can uh, relieve some of the stress that we have on the sole supplier. Um, another instance is um, uh, forgings for uh, 155 metal cases for ammunition. 155 ammunition is obviously one of the key uh, pieces of um, ammunition that uh, munitions that Ukraine is using. 
the foraging presses for those uh, cases are 55 feet tall and occupy spaces that are multiple rooms large. So they're not just something you can go buy off the shelf. They have to be manufactured. It takes a long time. Um, so, you know, we're, we're tackling those kinds of things. We're buying some presses, ordering some presses from some U.S. suppliers, but also from some allied suppliers. So, again, using that allied capability is helping us uh, mitigate some of those issues. That's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on MilitaryTimes.com and DefenseNews.com for more coverage. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.